The Tom Woods Show, episode 2163. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level, Tom Woods, is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. We've got rather an interesting and important topic to talk about here, especially after the past couple of years as we've observed the world get somehow exponentially crazier. And I feel like 10 years ago, I had legitimate complaints, and yet they seem like nothing (laughs) compared to what's happened over the past few years. And so joining us to talk about this situation, namely employment, trying to make your way in the world when you're surrounded by people who can't stand the sight of you, and a lot of them happen to be in HR departments, is our old friend Kevin Dolan, who started a group called Exit not too long ago, I guess around about a year ago. And in fact, I'll have him briefly recap his story. He's been on the program a couple of times before, but briefly recap his story. And he's helped people get out of very undesirable work situations or situations in which, let's say, they got doxxed and they didn't know where to turn. His group helps people get back on their feet and we hope be in an even more fulfilling situation than they were before it all happened. So Kevin, welcome back. Great to be here. Thanks, Tom. All right. Can you give us like the one minute version of what happened to you and how you got motivated to take action for people in this kind of way? Yeah, so I was a data scientist at an intelligence contractor and I was doxxed by a communist group along with a lot of my friends online. It was sort of a rolling process targeting a bunch of us. And I was fired within about 48 hours of that happening. And I had a decent sized following on Twitter and lots of people reaching out trying to help. But you know, because we're all in different situations and we've also got like security concerns about how much we reveal, it was difficult for people to, to help me. And it was difficult for me to help the people who were in a similar situation because like, I didn't have a law job for my lawyer friend because that wasn't the world I was in. But I realized that if I could get all of these people together and all of this goodwill working together in an organized way, that we'd be able to find a lot more solutions for a lot more people. So I created Exit, which involves accountability groups oriented toward either getting out of a corporate job or building the infrastructure, the network to get into a better situation. And yeah, it's been almost a year. August 6th will be the one-year anniversary. And we've just had a fantastic time. We've helped a lot of people and I'm really proud of it. Yeah, it's great. And of course, I observed it myself. I mean, I got to know more about your group and I could see that, you know, it's obvious how important it is. And so as we will reveal later, I ended up calling you and said, I want you to help some, I have some other people I need you to help. So, you know, these days, things have changed a little bit in, let's be blunt, where our enemies are to be found. Now, yes, obviously, they're all throughout the state apparatus, every level, every bureau, agency, whatever. They're just all shot through and through. But yet, a lot of the times on a daily basis, the kinds of struggles that people who, let's say, listen to this program are having are not necessarily with somebody from the Department of Labor, you know, or the Department of Homeland Security or something. They're with people in an HR department somewhere. You know, that's where the thought control is manifesting itself the most. So that's the world a lot of people now have to navigate. Now, on the other hand, you might say, ah, okay, but how many people really are doxxed in a given year? It's vanishingly small. All they have to do is just pretend to go along with some crazy ideas and just keep their mouths shut. And it's not really so bad. What would you say to that? Yeah, so I think the vax mandate situation was a huge wake-up call on that front. Yeah. Because people realized that it was not going to be enough to keep your head down and shut up, that you were going to be made to participate in material ways. And, you know, for the sake of you know YouTube delisting, I won't go into the details of the consequences of that decision potentially, but it's a consequential decision that you were forced to make. And I mean, this may seem like a small thing, but having your pronouns on your email signature, that's 
currently encouraged, eventually it will be expected, and then eventually it'll be mandatory. I mean, I just that's just the way it's the wind's blowing. And if that disgusts you, you need to take action now. These are slow rolling things, and your response to them also, it takes time to get your ducks in order. And in my case, I had a couple of advantages that I was able to leverage in that moment of crisis. Not everybody has those advantages or has the same advantages. And I think it's really important to wake people up before they hit that moment of crisis so that they're prepared. Yeah, indeed. You were giving a presentation, let's see, I guess it was a week ago, a little over a week ago now. I had an event in Orlando just for members of a particular group. And you got up there and said, well, you know, in the old days, you might have thought about it this way, that, okay, we're struggling with this problem of woke corporations, but all right, so fair enough, they don't want to hire you or they're going to make your life miserable if they do hire you. But, you know, you can always just quit and go to some non-woke corporation and that'll resolve itself. And there's a really, really glaring problem with that strategy, which is... There are no non-work corporations. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> That's the problem. I mean, the thing is, maybe there's one, <laughs> you know, maybe there's a handful, but you can round it off to zero safely. And isn't that remarkable? Like, isn't it crazy that every single Fortune 500 company, at least as far as I'm aware, is expecting you to wear the pride lanyard. They want to have these conversations about critical race theory Essentially, the only places that are, I would say, farther left institutionally than the Fortune 500 is like academia and like weird corners of academia. And so, I mean, that should raise questions for anybody with a free market orientation, a belief in sort of the marketplace of ideas, or the idea that businesses should be allowed to do what they want without interference from the state. It's like, well, where are the strings, where are the levers of control that are creating this situation where absolutely every corporation in America is an ideological lockstep? And I would argue that it has to do with anti-discrimination law. You look at what happened with Elon Musk and Tesla. There was an individual who claimed that they were subject to racial harassment on the Tesla production line. And it turned out that everybody involved in this incident was of the same race. The racial harassment angle is a little bit complicated, but this guy got $137 million. And so if you create a tort system where corporations can be fined $137 million for a nebulous... Well, for failure on their part to punish someone else's ideological crimes that are nebulous and hard to quantify. Well, in order to meet that regulatory requirement, in order to not get sued, what are they going to do? They're going to hire essentially a class of priests to read the bird guts and tell them, like, what are the rules today? Like, it would be one thing if, you know, the Department of Labor just came out and said, like, this is the set of things that people are allowed to say at your office. This is the set of things that they're not allowed to say. And like, yes, that would be terrible, right? But at least you would know where you stood. And the situation we're in right now is it is totally a matter of judgment. It's totally a matter of like vibes on the part of the judge, essentially. And so you can't just have a compliance officer that just makes sure you're following the rules. It has to be someone who is like on the cutting edge of this woke ideology. Like basically they have to be farther left than anybody else in the corporation so that the next farthest left person can't sue. And they have to enforce those laws on everybody so that that lawsuit doesn't happen. And I can tell you in my case, it wasn't because my company was real concerned about bad PR. As far as I know, they don't have a ton of... Like they're not a consumer advertising. Like they're not direct to consumer. So they don't really care about like publicity, unless it was huge. And you know, a minor analyst saying things online doesn't rise to that level. What they were concerned about is, okay, this guy said some things, we keep him on the payroll. And then somebody 
comes along and they want to stick their hand in our pocket and they say, oh, Kevin said X or did Y. And furthermore, you knew the kind of person he was. You knew that he had these horrible, mean beliefs and you didn't do anything. And so now you're responsible. And that is the way that every single corporation in America... I mean, it's genius in a way. Like, How could you get billion-dollar power centers, these corporations, multi-billion dollar? How could you get them to hire their own secret police, hire their own people to enforce your ideology? And it's this very simple incentive structure of they don't want to get sued. So that, I think, is how it's happened. And that feeds you the solution. Like, well, if this is how the problem is happening, if they're not actually sending literal secret police to come kick in your door, then you need to find a way to get out of this corporate system. Yeah, because the other solution, of course, is unthinkable, which is that they repeal anti-discrimination law. Unthinkable in the sense that it's just politically not feasible, it would never happen. It's true that... A long way off. Right. It's true that the CRT stuff and some of the other craziness has made some conservatives willing to entertain radical thoughts about the education system that they were not entertaining two or three years ago. That's good. But there's just no way. There's no political way. If you could imagine the propaganda, it would just be absolute pandemonium if you even proposed it. And there's way too many people who benefit from the current system. Can you imagine the hundreds of thousands of lawyers who benefit from that system? Letting that go away? So this is something where... Yeah, you should hold aloft the pure libertarian position on it. Always, never compromise. But keep your expectations tempered because that movement, unfortunately, is not going anywhere. So, right. so therefore, you're right. So you have to build some kind of an alternative to this unless you want to go crazy. Unless you want to go crazy every day you're at work. If that's what you like, go ahead and do it. But And then a lot of times, you know, I remember you were mentioning that you have a lot of people who, let's say, got into a corporate job because... You know, they married young, they were in their 20s, they had to provide for their family, they didn't have much leverage yet, they didn't have much experience, so they just took some soul-sucking job, and now they just want to get out. It's not necessarily that HR is coming down on them, necessarily, it's just the job itself is not what they want to be doing. They just want to get out. And so we have to support them in one way or another. Absolutely. I mean, and you mentioned how rare it is for people to be doxxed, and that's true it's pretty rare. And that's not most of the people that we help at Exit. There's a few, and it's great to be involved in helping those guys. But for every one person who actually gets doxxed, I mean, it's tens of thousands that are afraid of that. And it can rise to the level of like, oh, specifically, there's things I'd like to say, and I'm not going to say them because I don't get fired. But it can also just be like, I'm not even going to think about that. I'm not even going to turn my mind on when this subject comes up because it's so radioactive. It's so dangerous. And when you inculcate that kind of fear, it then becomes a social contagion because it's like nobody around me is willing to have these thoughts or articulate them. And to even start the conversation is extremely dangerous. And so part of what people tell me when they come into the group is it just feels so good to be able to be honest. And there are other entrepreneurship groups out there, but I'm hearing from people who have been involved in those that like the problems that they're dealing with as liberty-minded people, as you know, people who believe in believe in America essentially, is that it's no longer safe to be yourself in those groups. And so this is a place where you can be safe. I actually hadn't known that about different entrepreneur groups, that even in those groups, you have to shut your mouth like, oh, this is supposed to be a support group for me. and I can't even talk here. And the thing is, it's not even like all day long, I want to be refuting left-wing propaganda. It's that all day long, I don't want to have to measure everything I say or worry about this particular word or whatever. I don't want to feel constantly put upon by the politicization of all of life. Plus, I want to be able to make friends I think it's hard to make friends, genuine friends with somebody who would gladly see your life ruined at the drop of a hat. You know, I want to be able to make friends with normal people who wish me well. So what is it then? Obviously, you have your group. What's the idea then? So you say the strategy has to be we get out of this. What does that look like? 
Yeah. So I think the strategy has to be building a position of strength and getting away from these things that make you vulnerable, whether that's the dependence on the financial system, whether that's dependence on a corporate job, to break away from those things. And you know, we're not talking about like withdrawing and running off into the woods. There are people for whom that sounds fun and I'm for them. God bless them. But what we're talking about is strategically exiting from positions of vulnerability. And you and I had some great conversations one-on-one about this and determined that the same course of action could be taken with your group and that we could build something where people in your orbit could change their lives and get robust, get anti-fragile. And so we've started Tom Woods School of Life. And right. that involves expert webinars from people who can talk about relocation, who can talk about homeschooling, even things like health, because health is hugely important. And you can't trust a damn thing they say about that either. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and so much of your dependence on those systems is a problem. And so we have these accountability groups, just like we have at Exit, that are designed to help people start businesses, get more independent, And ultimately, for me, the long-term goal is to create an entire parallel network of people who care about each other and care about getting out of this thing so that we can take advantage of these massive... Because so many of our people are so smart and so well-networked and so competent. And if you just get them in a room, I'm finding that... I don't know that I expected this going in, but I'm finding that like the smartest people in the world are thinking about this problem. And even if they've got ideological differences, like they don't have the same solution in mind, they're all looking around at each other and they're like, all right, what do we do about this? How do we get out of this? And so all I had to do for my group, and I've noticed the same thing with yours, all you had to do was raise the flag, just you know, set a rally point, say, hey, we're all getting together and we're all going to help each other. And you know, in my case, it was very loose starting out. It was literally just, hey, we're going to try to do something. And I mean, I had 60 people in the first week sign up. And you, know, you had a really dramatic interest in Tom Woods School. And yeah. it evolves over time. And now we've gotten to a point where we actually have this really refined, really effective, powerful offering. You're connected to a specific accountability group that... That's sort of like your throw stuff at the wall group. You can talk about whatever you're working on at whatever stage. You don't have to have a fleshed out idea. You can even just be at the point of like, I've never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I just hate my job. I just want to figure something else out. And that group connects to a larger group led by your facilitator. And as you develop ideas in your small group, you get a little bit of polish on them. You bring them to the larger group. And then eventually we can help you bring them to the entire network. So it's you have this incubator, this cocoon to work on things, but you also have a place to go with your finished product, which I think is incredibly powerful. Folks, let's take a moment to thank our important sponsor, Policy Genius. In an unpredictable economy, life insurance can offer peace of mind that anyone who relies on you financially, and that's a child, a parent, even a business partner, will have a financial cushion if something happens to you. And since life insurance typically gets more expensive as you age, it's smart to get a policy sooner rather than later. Well, Policy Genius is an insurance comparison website that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in one place to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. So all you have to do is head to policygenius.com and you'll get personalized quotes in minutes, and you'll be able to find the right policy for your needs. And the licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. They're on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make decisions with confidence. And what's more, it doesn't cost you anything extra to use Policy Genius. Policy Genius does not add on extra fees. It keeps your personal info private, doesn't sell it to third parties. Policy Genius has thousands of five star reviews across Google and Trustpilot. They have options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. 
And since 2014, Policy Genius has helped over 30 million people shop for insurance. Head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. I've been hopping in on these groups. The website is tomschooloflife.com. I'm reopening it for just a few days, the beginning of August. So I will show up to these groups that we have too. By the way, my original idea was to have exit merge with the Tom Woods School of Life. And then we decided they really are distinct things, but I just want to take the genius behind exit and bring him in as the guy who runs the way the groups all function. So I sit in on, I surprise people by showing, because there are so many of them, there's no way I could be at all of them. We have professional facilitators who are there. But the other night, there was somebody who's developing an educational product for children that I like very much. And I said, well, I happen to know a guy who has half a million people on his email list, and it's an email list for parents with kids who would absolutely love this product. And if you just are willing to share the revenue with him, he'll mail that. I'm pretty sure he'll mail that to his 500,000 people. How do you think that will do for a nice little burst out of the gate? You know, So these are the kinds of connections people make in groups like this. And this is why there is strength in numbers. It's that you know, one individual has so much potential, so many possibilities. But when there are two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, it becomes exponentially greater, the possibilities of discovering synergies and not to mention, I've got a couple people running all the groups, so they know everybody in every group. And so they right. can say, wait a minute, I know this guy in the group that meets Monday night at eight who could probably help you with this or th- that kind of thing. And everybody's excited about it because they feel like I have spent a lot of time reading articles by libertarians telling me what's wrong and complaining <laughs> about what's wrong. Right. I've read all those articles, I've memorized all the talking points, and they haven't done me a damn bit of good. They haven't done anything for me because I'm still in the same situation. I feel like now, I've look, I've paid my dues in the libertarian world. I've written the books, I've written the articles, I've made the videos, but now it's time to actually help people in these situations. And that's what we're doing. Absolutely. You know, my group's significantly smaller, but we've had six-figure capital funds raised for a particular project, a film project. I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of what can be accomplished with these networks. And, you know, I would say the way that we build tribe the way that we get people to connect on an honest human level is you create these networks of reciprocity. Everybody should have something they want to give and everybody should have something they want to get or something to learn, something to teach. And it's been incredibly powerful to watch the friendships grow and then become partnerships. And it's just phenomenal. And I would say the reason that we do accountability groups, the reason that we connect people in this context is that it allows for a structure like, I mean, on one level, it's an excuse to get together, right? It's a structure to make friends and to connect with people. But I'm a firm believer that you can't just get together for the sake of getting together with strangers. Like, you know, there are lots of people who are like, I'm going to create like a secular version of church just so people can get together. And my experience has been that doesn't work because it has to be built around something. People have to have a reason to be there. And so we are building tribe. We're building intimacy. We're building connection. People are making these deep friendships while accomplishing something really important. And I think sometimes attempts to network on the basis of like just theory, like, hey, we all believe in the same ideology or the same worldview they fizzle because it's like, what are we actually about? And so I love that this thing is action-oriented. I love that this thing is like, all right, we're going to actually change our situation, make it better. It reminds me of the old days when people would say to me, okay, you've taught me all this information about history. What do you want me to do with it? And I would have no answer. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you guys think of that. I'm the historian. You guys think of what we're supposed to do with it. I don't, I don't know. And then I just got to a point, especially, I think what happened with me was during COVID, so many people went along with craziness that they could refute, you know, without that much difficulty. And yet they couldn't even be bothered to exert the effort to not have their own lives ruined that I realized, okay, all right, well, maybe the best use of my time is not shouting into the wind, you know, to people who maybe don't even care. They don't even want freedom. They, why am I wasting my time? Now, I'm still going to do the Tom Woods show, which does try to reach, you know, in principle, the whole world. But I thought to myself, Maybe it would make more sense in light of what I've just seen from mankind to focus my efforts on that sliver of them who have happened to come into my orbit, 
who are action-oriented, who do want to be free, and not just politically free, but in the colloquial sense too, to live a satisfying life, you know, where 40 hours plus a week, they're not made miserable doing something they hate, that their kids can get educated by, you know, people who don't despise them. I mean, just basic things. We're not asking for a whole lot here, and yet it's become very difficult to get. So I've pivoted a bit in that direction, that I want to just help people who are in this crazy situation. One quick thing, why do you call them accountability groups? I mean, it almost sounds like an AA meeting. (laughs) Well, I think it's important that people not only share their goals, but take responsibility for them. And I mean, I'm finding just empirically that people who show up to these calls and they take responsibility for what they're doing, they get results. I mean, the simplest example I can give you is one of the guys in our fitness call at Exit. He showed up every week to tell us like, oh, well, you know, I ate cookies and it was a birthday party or it was the 4th of July or whatever. And so I failed. But then we had a six-month weight loss competition and after six months of him calling in to be like, oh, I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I messed this up, he won that competition by like 15 pounds. Just because by virtue of showing up and taking responsibility for successes and failures, he was able to get the weight off. And I would say that goes for businesses too. We've had guys setting up you know, a school or setting up an online business, an e-commerce business. And the ones who talk in detail, talk about specifics. And I think your audience and my audience, they're abstract thinkers. They love to live in the realm of ideas. And that's cool because it makes them really interesting to talk to. It makes them farsighted about the big picture in a way that a lot of people are not. Like you're saying, you know, people who just don't want to be free. These people want to be free. The challenge maybe is that like me, they're primarily idea guys. And so it's not necessarily that that kind of thinking isn't valuable, but you've picked all the low-hanging fruit in that world. And guys like me, guys like my guys in the group have left a lot of low-hanging fruit out there in this world of doing, in this world of the concrete. And so the accountability groups create an environment where it's like, all right, no BS, no theorizing. How are we moving the ball this week? And for that type of guy in particular, it can be incredibly powerful. Well, I was in a couple of groups a couple of weeks ago. And I said that my particular piece of accountability would be that I was going to finish at least my end of it, not the designer, but my end of it, I was going to finish my next ebook because I, I need to build my list up again. You have to, otherwise it whittles away through attrition. So I said, I'm going to do that. And then over the weekend, when I had a little spare time, you know, everybody in the household was occupied with something. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I only need 45 more minutes to finish this thing. And I wasn't even sure I would be back in the groups on Monday, but I thought, I just can't go there without finishing this. <laughs> you know, so it really did. It made me bang it out. It's already out there. I've gotten the proofs back. It actually pushed me forward a little bit, just the presence of that thing. I do want to say one other thing. We're not saying that the solution is for you to retreat into the woods, although I have no objection to people who feel like that's their passion and that's how they want to live, you know, quote, off-grid and stuff like that. I know people who do that and that's wonderful for them. I would probably eat myself alive if I did that. I I would hate every minute of every day. That is absolutely not the way I want to live. So I feel like this is a false choice. Either you live in Wokistan or, you know, you live in the wilderness. You can choose one of those options, but I feel like we're trying to give people a third option. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are so many angles, so many types of jobs that work for people like us who are not going to play ball with, with all this stuff going on. Jobs that are remote allow you to work for anyone from anywhere, meaning instead of being tied to the particular, you know, city that you live in, or else you've got to, you know, spend, you know, five figures moving your family. If you could work for anyone in the world and you could go live anywhere you wanted to, then you've got choices not only about your profession, you've got choices about your jurisdiction, right? Like, oh, the jobs are in the Bay Area. So I got to go buy a California compliant AR-15 with like a five round magazine, you know, and just put up with that's a 
minor example, but you got to put up with just unbelievable absurdity, you know, poop and needles in the street. And if you can get a remote job, you don't have to deal with any of that. You can get that same opportunity, but you can go live somewhere beautiful in Missouri or in West Virginia. And there are jobs like, you know, at the meetup, we heard a fantastic presentation from Henry Bingaman about copywriting and the opportunity to get paid to write. Like a lot of our type of people, that's one of the ways you can leverage being an idea guy or an idea gal is to get paid to write. And he had just an unreal presentation on that. I would say also jobs where you are responsible for the entire production process. So like if you're a cog in a machine that does a thing, you become replaceable. And not only that, but the skill set that you acquire in the course of that job kind of sharpens you to a point in that particular niche. It makes you more effective as a component than as a, an individual producer. But like, there's only so much division of labor for being a plumber or for being an electrician. You have to be in charge of the entire process, which is why there's no Amazon for plumbing. These jobs, because they put the entire production process in one person's hands, and that person can then take their skill set anywhere they want to go, that could be being a general contractor. Plumbing is just one example, but software development is exactly the same. Like designing a website, you can do that entirely by yourself. You don't need this giant infrastructure to do that job. And so it becomes something that you can take with you that's yours. And that, I think, is one of the best ways to escape from these giant systems that are chewing people up. You mentioned a guy named Henry Bingaman. I'm going to try to get him on the show. I'm a client of his, actually. And it's weird being a client of somebody who's younger than you. you know, <laughs> as I get older, it's weird being in that position. Like I, When I was younger, every time I'd go to a concert, of course, the musician is older than I am, right? Because I'm just a kid. Now I'm knocking on the door of 50 and I'm hiring people to work for me who are way younger than I am. <laughs> like, what is going on here? But the event that you're talking about, the weekend before last, I had an event just for School of Life people and it was free to attend because I paid for it. I paid for all the food. I paid for everything. Okay, I paid for all the speakers and all the speakers came right from the program because the program is full of talented, smart people who understand what I'm trying to do in this and, and are excited about it. And so Henry offered to give a presentation to the group. It was a, by the way, I had Dave Smith come down and do comedy. You were there, of course, you spoke. Yeah. I had Dave Smith do comedy just for our group exclusively. I flew him down. We had an absolute blast. Everybody had a great time because they're all action-oriented people and the synergy in that room of all these different people with all these different projects and all these visions, it was great to be part of that and not just another thing of speeches about how important free speech is or how important <laughs> it is not to have price controls. All right, yeah, I 100% agree, but we have to do something fast. So he gave this presentation on copywriting. Now, about a thousand episodes ago, I had the guy who has been called by McGraw-Hill, America's best copywriter, Bob Bly, come on, and make exactly the same pitch, the same kind of pitch. But Henry was getting up there and saying, look, being a copywriter, first of all, we're not talking about intellectual property like copyright and patent. We're talking about writing copy. So anything you write that sells something, so it could be an email, an ad, whatever it is, that's copywriting. And he made the case that that's a great occupation for libertarians. Number one, I'm not sure he made this point, but number one, libertarians don't think there's a moral problem with selling things. So you know, writing something about why you should buy something does not cause them moral agony because we don't see that there's a problem with it. Right. But secondly, it's something you can learn in like a month. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be the world's greatest copywriter in a month, but in the same way that you can learn basketball in an afternoon doesn't mean you're going to be Michael Jordan, but you can at least know what the rules are and what the best practices are and then just practice them. So it's not like you have to go to school for 10 years and get into debt. There's no credential either. There's no certification to be a copywriter. So there are all these different things, and you can work wherever you want. And he has, in his career as a copywriter, his copy has sold $300 million of goods and services. Now, that's a guy, normally, I would have had to go out and find and pay him a fortune to come speak at my event. But he's already a member of my group. He's an ordinary member like anybody else. Like That's the kind of person I managed to attract when I made this appeal. Because as you say, the really bright, smart people out there know something's wrong. They know something's wrong and they want to do something about it. So 
I was glad to be able to hold that event, have all these people actually meet each other in real person. You didn't have to, like I can't force you out of your house, but I said, as an option, I'm going to pay for an event for us all to come down and meet each other. And we did it. And they had a great time. And one of the points that I wanted to raise is the honesty of the type of person that we're talking about. The fact that what galls them about this system, what galls them about having to go to work is feeling like they have to be complicit in lies all the time. And what's powerful about getting a group of people like that together, in addition to them being action-oriented, is that, like you're saying, you weren't going to go back to that call and have to kind of live with the shame of not having finished your ebook. But you had said something. You had put something out into the world. You said you were going to do it. And it ate at you that you hadn't done it yet until yeah. you did it. Yeah. And so I think that's another reason why accountability is so valuable for people like this. Because... They are the type of people who get upset when they say they're going to do something and they don't deliver. And so you're leveraging the natural strengths of these people to create something really extraordinary. And I wanted to touch on the value of the meetup. We saw this in Florida. I had a meetup in Salt Lake for my group where we had everybody do a five-minute presentation. And at the end of that five-minute presentation... Like it was probably 16 people in the group. And four or five of them walked up to me afterwards and said, Wow, I had no idea we had this kind of talent in the group. And of course, I'd been saying that as, you know, but ultimately. But of course, you're going to say it, right? So they need to see it for themselves. Of course, I'm going to say that. But yeah, so the power of the meetup, not only as a tool to like just show these people who's here, just like, get a sense for the power that's in the group. You saw that in Orlando for sure. They were like, wow. You know, one of the things that I noticed was that there were young people and they were young people who were in good shape and who looked good. You know, maybe some people will regard that as superficial, but I don't. I think it's a sign of you're in a group of people who have vitality, who are put together. And that was very powerful for me to see. And so, yeah, in-person meetups talking about real stuff is critical to this thing. And it was great to be there. And my vision for this thing was never to be just about business. There are some people who don't want to start a business or be an entrepreneur or they're perfectly happy with their job or they're retired and they don't need a job. There are all kinds of people who are not interested in that piece of it. That's okay. That's not what the program is exclusively about. It's all these different areas where they're coming after you and we're going to devise ways for you to prosper anyway. And so I want to extend the accountability groups to groups that cover diet, fitness, and health also, because, you know, let's get ourselves in the best physical condition we can be. Let's make sure we're eating the best food we can eat. And I think accountability might be even more valuable for reaching a goal like that and reach those goals with people who, you know, who really do like you, you know, who who can know the whole you. You don't have to fear that you might say the wrong thing and then they're going to shun you. You know, you, you can accomplish these goals with people who can actually stand you. So that's, <laughs> that's what I'm shooting for. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here, Kevin, and just tell people, if you want to be in my group, we're opening it up for just a few days and then we're closing the doors again. That's the very beginning of August, very beginning, like first through the fourth. It'll be open. So get on the notification list if you'd like to be notified when that happens. The website is Tom, my name, TomSchoolOfLife.com. So TomSchoolOfLife.com, go there, just enter your email address and I'll send you a note letting you know we are open for business. And then we're closing the doors and we're rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. So Kevin, I cannot tell you what an indispensable part of this you have been. You have this very important experience that you've had with your group that I could not replicate and you have knowledge and experience that I don't have. So one of the great things about being a podcast host, you talk to so many darn people, there's somebody for everything. And I thought, well, I better get Kevin on the phone and see if he can help. And now I've got you kind of directing this program for me within the school of life. And it's been tremendous. People are absolutely raving about it. And so all I can say is I can't thank you enough. So I appreciate you. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great to talk to you. All right, gang, I am going to do my best to get Eric July on the show here to talk about his unbelievable success that I'm sure you heard about. Certainly, if you're on my mailing list, you know about it. But also, you may know from just general social media or Eric's social media in particular, 
the unbelievable success he's had in the launch of his new comic book enterprise. And I want to talk to him about it because it is an amazing, amazing achievement. In a matter of a week, he's brought in over two and a half million dollars. When he launched it, by the next day, he had a million dollars in revenue already, and he's got no big institutional backing of any kind. It's simply on the basis of his own following and word of mouth. And so it's an amazing story. And it's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about, is that Eric is going to do a lot of good here, and not least for himself, pursuing something he loves and doing it exactly the right way and having this kind of success. This is an element of what it means to live a good and satisfying life. And so I want to highlight stories like this, especially when they're happening to such good friends as Eric. I just couldn't be happier for the guy. It's so, so thrilling. So stay tuned for that. He got tied up at the warehouse, so I wasn't able to get him on. But let me tell you something. I am being as annoying to him as I can be without having him mute me on his phone, okay? I'm trying to strike that magical balance. In the meantime, you're going to want to be on the notification list for when the Tom Woods School of Life opens up once again because that window is very brief and then it slams closed again and we knuckle down and get to work. So get on that list. It's TomSchoolOfLife.com. That's where to go. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.